right, praise God, everybody. How's everybody praise doing? Good. How's everybody doing? Good. So I want to share something that uh, the Lord gave me on Sunday. Uh, when Susanna was doing her intro and people were testifying and all that, uh, this kind of came to me, and I, I put some scriptures together because I feel that this, this it has to do with what he gave me to share. Uh, so I'm going to read from, from the King James Version, which I'm, I don't usually do because of the English in it. So bear with me. This is uh, Romans 5, verse 6 through 10. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Isaiah 41.10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yeah, I will help thee, yeah, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Matthew 6, 25-32 Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye through for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take not thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need for all these things. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. So this is just a few scriptures that I chose to kind of illustrate a few of the many promises that God has given us through his word. And, and the Bible is not only, I mean, it has some history about the, the people of Israel and all that, but, but it's a word that God gave us to, to assure us, this is what I have for you. So as, as Suzanne and, and people were testifying on Sunday, I'm sitting there and I'm, all I can think of is, is the will of God. And, and that brought me to the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm going to read it, and, and then I'm going to explain this. After the manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. And that's the part of that verse that I want to zero in. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that part where it says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What I feel the Lord was telling me is that everything that it says in the Bible that is a promise of me to you is already done in heaven. So when you believe what I'm telling you and you speak it and you continue to say it and believe it and trust me, when that manifests here on this earth, that's when my will is done on earth. Amen. So sometimes, and, and a clear example of this is my wife. I was speaking to her this uh, weekend, and I know she's a believer, but she has lost hope because of all the things that are happening. When she gets to the point that what the word of God says, it's written in the tablet of her heart, and she believes it and speaks it, and it starts manifesting, she's going to be a completely new person, because that's exactly what happened to me. Yeah. Hallelujah. I have known of God. I did not know God until I said, God, I want you in my life. Tell me what I have to do. And as soon as I said that, things started to happen, and my spirit started to get in sync like you've spoken before with what he says. And I can hear him now clearer, things that he wants me to do, he wants me to say. And I'm telling you, as I speak these things, and I declare them, and I believe them, and things manifest in my life, I know that that's his will that is being done on this earth for my life. Yeah, that's Anyone has anything that they want to share? James. Wait.
I want to share a testimony too. Uh, my mom sent me a, a message yesterday asking me for, for prayer for one of my cousins. Uh, she was telling me that her, my mom's sister, my aunt, uh, her grandson was taken to the emergency room because his mom saw him and he, he, was, he was really pale and all that and very weak. And when they took him to the emergency room and they and they checked his, his blood, his blood sugar level 
wasn't 900. And, uh, you know, they started tending to him and all that, and, and everybody started praying. And in a matter of hours, it went from 900 to like 135. Wow. And so today it's, it's at a normal level. And she was telling me that all the doctors were telling my cousin that they don't know how he made it to the hospital walking. Mm -hmm. That the only reason why he's alive right now is because of divine intervention, yeah. because there is no mm -hmm. scientific explanation whatsoever to how he's alive right now. Mm -hmm. So they're calling him the miracle child over at the hospital. So that was pretty good.
Thank you, we come to you right now. We cast all of our burdens to you, Lord. We thank you, Father, because you give us your word, a word that is to show us what you want for us as your children, Father. That is your will, what it says in your word. And we believe that. And because we believe that, and we write it in the tablet of our hearts, Lord, we know that it's going to come to pass. When it comes to pass, your will is being done on this earth. Thank you, Father, for giving us your son. We right now lift up all of those in need, whether it's for restoration, whether it's for healing, whether it's for some sort of breakthrough financially, relationally, anything, Lord. Whatever it is, we know that you are going to change whatever situation is being brought to you, Lord, because your will says that you want us to be prospering. Friday, June 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Do you know what we're focusing on? Yeah. It hasn't been revealed? Yeah. All right. We'll wait for it. All right, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Thank the Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Thank you, Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. The Lord reviews the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Thank you, Lord. John, would you mind taking the offering? worship.
Cause there is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. And I will I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad. There is a river, oh, so full of grace, yes, it flows from Emmanuel's name.
Like a mighty river, Lord, manifest your glory. Let your kingdom that is within be revealed. Come, oh Lord. Yeah. 
Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. You've left nothing undone, Lord. Every need that we have, you've supplied for. Every situation, every circumstance, you've already met the need. It's only for us to believe to see all those things become reality in our lives. We bless you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for the finished work of the cross. And it is finished, Lord. Yes. Our healing, yes. our deliverance, our prosperity, our breakthrough in every area, it is finished. And we declare that to be the final word, Lord, in every circumstance. Your word is forever settled Hallelujah. in heaven. Hallelujah. And we settle it here by the authority that you've given us yes, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 
Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise Thank God. You, <clears throat> Thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Thanks for being here tonight. I don't know if I should turn around and preach the other direction. Or, or wait a minute. So everybody's out there on the other side. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, uh, last Wednesday we were talking about uh, what the Old Testament is all about. Who can tell me what the Old Testament is all about? Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I was inspired to agree with John. Amen. It's all about Jesus. Praise the Lord. And uh, I was thinking here tonight, you know, uh, I was working on some stuff for Sunday today, as well as this. Sometimes I, they, they have a tendency to kind of blur, but, uh, you know, when, uh, when I was in a, a uh, what do I say, a more rigid kind of religious uh, church, I saw God do some miraculous things in my life and in the lives of other people. But he did it by grace. In spite of the fact that I had a tendency to believe that it had a lot more to do with how much I was doing, giving up, sacrificing, working, praying, fasting, and all those things. And, uh, and the reason that is uh, interesting to me is because it's the same attitude of Israel under the Old Covenant. They thought the more sacrifices, the more they gave, the more they uh, gave of themselves, I'm saying, the more they uh, denied themselves, the more God would do. And that's not true. It's never been true. David said, sacrifice and offering, he would not. He d that's not what he's after. Amen. It's always been a gift. Healing's always been a gift. Deliverance has always been a gift. Uh, when Israel complained and murmured and, and carried on and everything else, God still delivered them. He still gave them the promised land. Now, uh, when we think about the manifestation of that reality in the fullness of time, the fullness of that reality was revealed in Christ. In other words, the reality that God always intended, the purpose that God always had, the personality that God always was, the character of God never changed. He didn't one day, you know, go from being a, an angry, vengeful, you know, going to get you God to a New Testament, Jesus God. Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm just simply a manifestation of that God. Whatever you see me do, you see the Father do. Uh, what, whatever Jesus did was the will of God. And God's will never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, his will is the same yesterday as it is today and as it will be forever. So for Jesus, for example... Uh, people that say, God sent this storm. Well, if God sends storms, then Jesus was fighting against God when he calmed the storm. So God isn't sending hurricanes and tornadoes and whatever else to destroy people. That's part of the fallen world that we live in. This crap happens. But Jesus rebuked the wind. He said, peace be still. And likewise, with disease or whatever it might be, financial uh, crisis, uh, relational issues. Uh, it's never God creating those things. And because it's not God creating those things, we know that that's not his will. Therefore, we can speak against that. We can speak in agreement with his will. And the scripture says that whatever we ask, if we ask it in his will, we know that he hears us. 
And here's the even more powerful part. If he hears us, we know we have our petition. So in other words, if you just open your mouth in agreement with God, it's done. It's got to happen. Praise the Lord. Because he's a good God. Because he's a God of grace. He wants to give good gifts to his children. He doesn't want to give good earnings, you know, good wages. He wants to give good gifts. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, let's, let's look at uh, three scriptures here. John chapter 5. Verse 39, these are scriptures that we used last week. I'm just kind of recapping a little bit here as I just go a little bit deeper into this. John 5, 39, John 5, 46, and John 8, 56. And you'll recognize these right away because we talked about them some last week, but I'm just, I'm just kind of reestablishing the fact that uh, Jesus is the message of this Bible from Genesis to Revelation and every single thing in between. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, they didn't have a New Testament when Jesus said that. So the only scriptures they could have been looking at to find testimony of Jesus was the whole Old Covenant, the whole Old Testament, right? For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Moses wrote the first five books, the Pentateuch, of the uh, Torah. So we know for five, in five books there, Moses was preaching Jesus. Regardless of what we're seeing on the pages, he was preaching the gospel. Amen? Grace, in other words. All right? So let's go to uh, John. Uh, that's, let's go to uh, verse uh, 46. Chapter 5. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So it just validates what I just got through saying. That first five books, that's what he was writing about, was Jesus. All types, all shadows, all symbols, all metaphors, but it was always about Jesus. Every, no sacrifice ever did anything about sin until Jesus. All the blood that was spilled, that didn't, that didn't, Away. They didn't do anything with sin. It was all a type of Jesus. It was all talking about Jesus. It wasn't talking about this is how we're going to take care of your sin. It was talking about the ultimate one, the only one that can really deal with sin is Jesus. It was constantly pointing us to Christ, the lamb that was slain, the blood that was spilled, you know, all of the, the uh, articles of furniture in the, in the temple, all about Jesus. So had you believed Moses? You would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Okay? Now, John 8, verse 56. And here we go back even further. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So we're going back 400, at least 400 and some years before Abraham. I mean, before Moses, to Abraham. And it says that he rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Praise the Lord. What, uh, what is that day? The day of grace. Grace came by Jesus, right? So there's always been grace. God has always dealt in grace. It's not a new thing in the, just because it's in the New Testament, and we don't see it clearly in the Old Testament. We don't see anything clearly in the Old Testament. It's all types and shadows. So you have to have some uh, basis on which to read the Old Testament to get the true meaning. And that is coming from the understanding of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It, it reveals and opens up everything in the Old Testament. Uh, it's said all the time, the Old Testament is the New Testament hidden. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So uh, John writing this, had a Christ-centered view of the Old Testament. That's why he's writing what he's writing. He had a revelation, right? But now let's look at something that looks contradictory, and that's what I want to explain a little bit tonight. John 1.17.
For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Right? So just if we just took that scripture out of context, if we just read that scripture, it looks like Moses was law and Jesus was grace. Like they were two opposites. But what is it? What does this verse really mean? What, what is it trying to teach us about the relationship between the Old and the New Covenant? Or the Old Testament and the New Testament, whatever you want to call it. Because the whole story of the Bible is about the administration of grace. Praise the Lord. I'll say it again. The entire Bible, because it's about Jesus, is about the administration of grace. Let's, okay, go to 2 Corinthians, uh, Sheila, chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 11. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious or more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. It had, it was, it, it was made glorious, had no glory in this respect. And the, re, the respect that he's using here, or the reason why, is that the glory of the new covenant is so much greater, it looks like there is no glory in the Old, Test, in the old Covenant. Or you could say, the grace is so much more uh, profound and uh, plenteous that, it's all, that you almost miss that in the Old Testament because it's limited. Just like Jesus. You see Jesus everywhere in the New Testament, but you've got to look for him in the Old Testament because he's all types and shadows. It's all hidden. For what if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Still talking about the same thing. Okay? Now, go back to verse 4, if you will, Sheila. Same chapter here, but verse 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Now, what he's saying, you almost have to read that backwards, but what, he, what he's saying here, this is all in the same context of what we just read. We, the reason we have such trust in God is because we've seen him in Christ. If, you, if, you don't, if we don't have an understanding of this, there's, it seems like there's a conflict between what Jesus wants to do and what God wants to do. We know Jesus is love. Jesus wants to be good. Jesus is kind. He's loving. He heals and so on. But we've got this image of God as being kind of vengeful and angry and judgmental and, you know, this expectation of punishment or, or, or God withholding his favor somehow. And that's what Paul's trying to overcome here. He's trying to get us to understand that this is all pointing us from Christ to God, what God really is. To how God really relates. So that we can have everything that God wants us to have. So that we'll have the expectation of uh, all things that God wants for us. See, the, the New Testament tells us that the, the, the coming of Jesus changed the way grace is administered. It doesn't change grace, just change the, changes the way that we receive it, the way it's administered to us. The Old Testament administered grace, still it was the grace of Jesus or the grace of God, in a way that suited the times and the people that were in those times, in the metaphors, in the types, in the shadows. They weren't living by faith, right? It was, it was an exception to the rule. And I don't mean that as a pun. It was an exception to the law or to the rule to, to operate in, in, in faith because the, the law never required faith. So 
the Old Testament administered the grace of God of Jesus in, in, in a way that suited the times in which the people were living and in the times in which the Old Testament was written. And it was and it operated through prophecies, through pictures, through symbols, types and shadows, in other words. It was glorious for the time. It was great for, for what it was in the time that it was. So continuing on in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Yeah, I believe there is. Yeah, 18 is the last verse. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through 18. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, that's not it. Just start at 12, but there, there is an 18. If I have to, I can read it out of my Bible. But. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 through 18. Uh, yeah, okay, back up. Uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, chapter 3. I'm looking at 3 and telling you 2, so. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Even unto this day. Now, get the picture here. The veil is not, there's a veil there, and, and what the veil is doing is covering something. The veil is proof that there's something being covered up. And the thing that's being covered up is what's revealed as soon as the veil is taken away, which is Jesus. So it was always there. Yeah. Grace was always there. Christ was always there. It just what they just weren't seeing it because there was a veil because of the law. They didn't see the grace that came through Moses because he had a veil. He put a veil over the glory of God was showing. Right? So they it eventually went away, the same as the law did, and when it did, it reveals what that was, what the purpose of that was, what the reality of it was, grace, okay? So the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So even today, if grace isn't preached in its fullness, there's still a misunderstanding about what God is saying and what God is doing, even in the New Testament, certainly under the Old Testament which is why we avoid the Old Testament so much, is because we think it's a different thing altogether, it's something altogether different. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Or when you start looking for Jesus, the Lord, then you don't, the veil is gone. The veil is no longer there blinding you. Once you start looking at the Old Covenant through the idea that this is about Jesus, all of a sudden, that veil is gone. Why? Because that's what it's about. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now Paul's talking about the people that have this revelation of the grace of Jesus Christ. So we're all, with an open face, beholding as if in the glass the glory of the Lord. We're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. All right? Now, so the same grace is to be administered directly. Now, the same grace that was in the Old Covenant is going to be administered now directly and only through Jesus. It, before, it came through the prophets, came through types, it came through symbols, it came through uh, shadows and pictures and so forth. But now this same grace comes one way. It comes directly and only through Jesus. 
grace administration is under new management, you could say. Okay? And because of that, new management, it's even more glorious. It's not a new message. It's just a new management. It's not a new business, in other words. It's just a new management running the business and in a different way. But they're selling the same product. All right? 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 11. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. So if what was limited was glorious, then the fullness of that is going to be obviously more glorious. In other words, the New Testament is not a new business, as I said. But it's a new way of administering the same business of grace. It's a grace administration in a new way. It's administered. It's being put out there. It's being made available, right? It is. So here's the point we're trying to make. It isn't that the Old Testament was a different business. In other words, law, works, and then the New Testament is a new business, grace. That's not, the, that's not what this is about. It's not a contrast, in other words, of absolutes. Law versus grace. Law, grace. That's not what it is. It's a contrast of relatives. I understand what I'm saying. It's what's relative here is less grace, more grace. Not absolutes like the law and grace, but relative, less grace, more grace. That's the real contrast that we're dealing with here from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Not two different things, one thing hidden and the same thing revealed. It was there, it just was being administered in a, in a way that it wasn't as obvious, right. and so therefore you couldn't get as much benefit from it, so it was just less. And then it becomes greater in the fullness of time. Right. See? So, all right, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7 and 8. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious... That's the law. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? They were both trying to produce the same thing, but one was by the letter, which was limited and veiled because of the shadows and the types of people who didn't have faith. They had to kind of dig through it and try to figure it out, and only a few actually did, prophets right? David and others. How shall not the ministration then of the Spirit be more glorious? It'll be greater, in other words. He's not just talking about glory as we understand it. He's talking about quant quantity as well as quality. More grace, greater grace. Okay? So the old administration of grace was glorious, but the new administration of grace is far more glorious. All right, John 1.17 again. The law was given by Moses. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So back to the, I was talking about relative and absolutes. So the, it's not an absolute contrast here between law and grace. Again, but it's, a relative contrast between the lesser grace of the Old Testament and the greater grace of the New Testament. Okay? The law was given. That Greek word is E-D-O-T-H-E, -E, edothe. That's, that's the verb, the Greek verb for given. Grace came, another verb, and the Greek word for that is E-G-E-N-E-T-O, or egentio, and both verbs highlight God's graciousness. They're both talking about the same thing. But the second, egentio, intensifies and magnifies the first. 
So the, the came magnifies the given. But they're both talking about the graciousness of God. So the law was, in other words, the law was merely given. In Jesus, grace came. Now, there's a contrast Again, but it's one of degrees, not, not differences, not absolutes, not one was one thing and one was another thing. It's just a contrast of degrees. How much? So the grace that was received in Jesus added upon the grace that came through Moses and the law. Get it? The grace that came from Jesus simply added to and abounded over the grace that came by law. Why, did, why was the law there? To point us to Jesus. It was, there was a grace message. The association see, between the two is uh, it's what, we call, it's what we'd call continuity in anything else. Or the, the partial contrasted by the full. The sum by the all, or the this much by the whole, the whole amount. Amen? Amen? So it's continuity, but it's also a huge quantum leap, amen, that occurred in Jesus. It's the same thing, in other words, but it's such a huge, huge quantum leap of what that is by the coming of Christ. It's almost incomparable because of the amount, because of the quality and the quantity of grace that comes by Jesus. That's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's trying to get across here. Look at uh, verse 18, next verse. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So there was a grace under the Old Testament. Amen. That's, that's what he's telling us. There was a grace under the Old Testament. Now look at Galatians. We know that because of Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. See, we're not veiled with an open face. We're seeing it because it came by Jesus. It, it was a revelation. It comes to open and clear. So the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel, which is the gospel of grace, unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. The coming of Jesus was preached to Abraham before there was ever any law even. Right? But the grace that was preached to Abraham was superseded, or greater amount came, right? Look at 2 Corinthians again. Chapter 3, verse 10. Hope I'm not losing you, but I'm just beating a horse here, a dead horse. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. Now, he doesn't say that it wasn't glorious. He just said it hadn't any glory in comparison to the glory that excelleth. The glory that excelleth is Jesus so it had to be there in order for it to excel. You've got to have something if you're going to excel. Right? So the, here's what he's saying. The, the discoveries of grace or the revelation of grace that comes through Christ, the revelation of God, are now, today, under the New Te Covenant, under the New Testament, they're more clear. That's why we behold that glory open-faced. It's clear. And the distributions of grace are far more plentiful. This is grace instead of, or I should say, this is grace instead of grace. Big G, little g. Grace instead of grace. That's, that's, the, that's the idea of that he's trying to get across here. Amen. So let's just let's just use the Bible as an explanation for this or a definition or a clarification. In the, the New Testament view of the Old Testament is not a contradiction, right? 
In other words, you read the New Testament, it's, it's not a contradiction of the Old Testament, but it's a completion and a fulfillment of what the Old Testament's right. telling us. Jesus completed what the Old Testament could only do in part. Jesus, in the fullness, completed what was limited of the Old Testament. In every area, in every way. Limited understanding of God, limited revelation of God, limited understanding of God's love, limited understanding of God's grace because there was a limited understanding of God. So God reveals himself, the fullness of the Godhead in him, right, is just a fuller completion or revelation, not a different God, not a different Bible, not a different message, but a completion or a completing of everything that was in that Old Testament. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it or to complete it. So Jesus completed the Old Testament, could only do in part. So you, can't, you cannot say that Moses preached something opposite of what Jesus preached. Even though we insinuate that by saying, well, Moses preached the law and Jesus preached grace. But you can't really say that with any kind of... Uh, you know, honesty, because look at John chapter 5, verses 4, 46 and 47. John 5, 46 and 47. Again, my point is so that we have an expectation of good. Because this is what God's always wanted to do. He's always wanted to give us the fullness of his grace, of his favor, and, and we just didn't understand it. That's why he had to come in the flesh. So for had you believed Moses, then you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So he couldn't have been preaching something different if he was preaching Jesus, right? It couldn't have been a, you know, an opposite. But if you believe not his writings, how will you believe my words? See, he, this is what he's trying to explain to the Jews, the same thing that I'm trying to explain tonight, is that the, it's the same message. It's all about me. It's always been about me. You're looking, this for the, looking searching through the scriptures to see if you can find eternal life, and they're what's talking about me. In other words, they're saying, I'm trying to find what more can I do to assure myself of salvation. And Jesus is saying, I'm the answer. It isn't what you're doing. It's who I am. It's what I've done. You've got to believe. You've got to have faith. It's not about what you do. We'll do things, and we should do things, but not, not to gain God's favor or to be saved or to get blessings. We do it out of the the joy of what God has done for us out of, the, out of the reality of God's goodness and favor to us. You know, people do really nice things for you. You, you, you can't pay them back a lot of times, but you just feel, I want to do something for them. You know what I mean? I just want to do something for them because I'm grateful. I, I, I appreciate their kindness to me. Right? I mean, we all have those feelings. But you can't earn something that they just gave you in the first place. So, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. So you can't argue, or uh, let somebody else try to argue with you about the fact that Moses was preaching some opposite message than Jesus. Or Jesus wouldn't have quoted him and said, when he was preaching, he was preaching me. If you'd believed his words, you should believe me. If you believe what he wrote, you'd have to believe what I say. For unto us was the gospel preached. This is to the, he's talking to the Hebrews now. This is the book of Hebrews, and, he's, and it's written to Jews. So uh, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, the Gentiles. This is a Jew, Jewish, Messianic Jew, speaking to other Jews. And he's talking about this gospel of grace. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, the, the Gentiles. But the word preached did not profit them, or excuse me, it's the other way around, didn't profit them, the Jews, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So under the old covenant, Moses was preaching the gospel of grace, 
But they didn't exercise faith. They exercised works. They tried to do the law, amen, to get their things from God. And God's intent was for them to just trust him, have faith in him, and he'd take care of the law through the sacrificial process that was constantly pointing them to Jesus. It wasn't supposed to be about, you know, uh, let, let's, get the, let, let's, let's just keep offering up more lambs and more goats and more bullocks. The idea was to see Christ, see the mercy of God. He's taking an innocent to take care of your, what you should be punished for. That's grace. Praise the Lord. So you can't say that Israel, or under the law, had only the law, and we had the gospel, because he's telling us the gospel was preached to both of you. But only one of you responded in faith. The other responded in effort, in works, in earning, trying to earn it. And you can't get grace that way. You can't get salvation that way. You can't get your sins covered that way. So now go back to John chapter 1. Uh, let's see, John 1. Uh, well, let's, let's start with John 1, uh, verses 6 through 9. What I, what I really want you to see here is the contrast between less and greater, not between opposites. You hear me? You understand what I'm saying? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Uh, continue on. Verse 9 uh, through 9. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So John was a light, but he wasn't the true light. Right? John brought revelation, but he wasn't the full revelation. It wasn't the fullness. He was baptizing in water. He was doing some things, but they weren't like what Jesus would do. So it wasn't a contrast between opposites. John wasn't against Christ. He was the forerunner. He was all about Jesus. He just wasn't Jesus. He was pointing to Jesus. Amen? So he, he, he was, uh, look, if you look at uh, chapter 1, verses 23 through 27. There's another example of this contrast rather than opposites. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, says John. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, or uh, Elijah? Neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize you with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who cometh after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I'm not worthy to unloose. So, what's the, it isn't that, it's just that Jesus was preferred, right? Jesus was greater. Amen? Jesus was preferred before John. But John's ministry was still, it still came from God. Jesus declares him to be the greatest of the Old Testament. Right? So it came, his ministry came from God. It just wasn't as great as the ministry of Christ. So they're not contradictory. They're not opposites. It's just a question of contrast. One was less. One was greater. Amen? So the general argument is, that we are to exalt the preeminence of Jesus. Not compared with what was contrary to his gospel, but with what was a lesser degree. So we exalt Jesus not because the law was against Christ, but because it was a lesser revelation of Christ. A lesser revelation of God. They're not opposites. They're both trying to do the same thing. One just does it exceeding abundantly above what the other could do. Praise the Lord. All right, John 1.16, and we'll, we'll wrap up here.
and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Now, this, all of a sudden, for me at least, begins to make sense in the context of everything I'm saying. For, grace for grace. In other words, grace in addition to grace. You see what he's saying? That, that is what's being demonstrated then in the very next verse, verse 17. Grace for grace, or for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Supplementing the grace that is revealed in the Old Testament. The super abounding, it's, it's, it's you have this grace of the Old Testament, and then it is added to with the superabounding grace of Christ's incarnation that is revealed in the New Testament. That's what he's speaking of here. Grace for grace. Old Testament grace for New Testament grace. Limited, not totally understood, not completely received, and then superabundance of grace so much that it overflows you. A revelation of it. An understanding of it. The ability to receive it. All is magnified. All of it is, is super abundant in comparison. That goes back to what he was talking about. That which was glorious really has no glory in comparison to the glory which comes. The grace under the Old Testament is so insignificant. It's not insignificant by itself. It's insignificant in comparison to what comes from Christ, through Christ. One given, one comes. Super abounding. Amen? All right, let's finish with this. Romans 5, 17 through 21. And we'll quit with this. And this, I think, helps to bring these scriptures into context in relation to what we're talking about here in terms of grace. Romans 5, verse 17. For if one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Get this. The law comes along so that everybody is more aware of the offense, but where sin abounds, grace doth that much more abound. So the law produced grace. It revealed grace, but just in a limited way. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through the righteousness, through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's the message of the New Testament. That's the message of the Old Testament. They're not opposites. They're the same thing being administered in a different way. Same God, same love. Same compassion, same, care, same desires to, to meet people's needs, to do for them. Just the administration of it changes. It becomes super abundant in Christ so that we can have what God always intended for us to have, even under the old covenant. Think about David. People that understood this experienced grace. Right? Right? You look at the life of Saul and the life of David, just as one example. I, I always I thought, man, that doesn't seem fair. It's like to me, like Saul got the shaft. David got a pass. What did David do that was worse than what Saul did? It isn't a question of what they were doing. It's a question of what they were believing. David believed in the mercy of God, in the goodness of God, in the grace of God. That's why he was able to walk into the, te into the temple and do something that was dead against the law, and, and, and the breaking of that law required death to the person who, who perpetrated it. He goes in and eats the shoe bread, gives it to his men, takes a, the sword of, of Goliath out of there. What did he get for it? 
Nothing. What he got was a testimony from Jesus several thousand years later saying, that's why it's okay for my, my uh, apostles to uh, eat wheat on the Sabbath. They were accused of harvesting wheat. Now, let me, let me tell you something. What David did was one thing because it was, it was a crisis. They were starving. They were running away from, from Saul. And Jesus said he, he got a pass because he understood that God wants mercy more than he wants sacrifice. He understood grace, in other words. But Jesus said, I want to show it to you in an, even a different way. This is nonchalant grace. This is grace where it's not necessary. They weren't starving to death. They were just hungry. They were just bored. They're just walking through a wheat field or a corn field or whatever it was, and they're grab an ear of corn here, and they're eating a little corn as they're walking. They, they weren't starving. They were eating out of boredom. But they were harvesting because it was a literal harvest. They were picking the crop on the Sabbath day. And Jesus refers them back to a crisis and says, this is how God views his people. Right? Man was made for the Sabbath. The, the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for Sabbath. God's grace is there all the time for every situation. Not just when you're in crisis mode. You know, not just when you're dying and you need a, a healing. Not just when you're, you know, uh, you know, under threat of losing your home or something and you need some financial breakthrough. All the time. Like Sheila said, 20 minutes, peep, bing. It wasn't a crisis. It could have been. It might have felt like it, but it wasn't like you're, you're, you're all going to die tomorrow if this doesn't happen. Right? But it's still the grace of God. He's got your number, girl. He knows your name. He said, I hear Sheila. That's my daughter. Give her a call. Because he hears his other daughter saying, I need somebody to take care of this thing right away. God goes, hey, perfect. Zip. Everybody gets blessed. And God gets the glory. And it was just because of grace. That's the way the whole kingdom works. Say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Lord. God bless you for your patience. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Hope to see you all back here Sunday. In the meantime, expect a miracle. Praise the Lord. That's who you are.